Okay guys, so in this unit, we're gonna talk about the neurohormonal effects of heart failure. Now, as a reminder, heart failure is either a condition where we have impaired pumping performance or abnormal filling pressures. Either way, there's impaired cardiac function, impaired myocardial performance. When that happens, quite often we have changes to perfusion downstream, right, to other organs. The kidneys um, are a very, very important organ in this and in really maintaining fluid status, maintaining a lot of different things, electrolyte balance, and it's used to a high amount of blood flow. When the kidney does not get normal blood flow, it's not particularly happy. And when it's not particularly happy, um, because it's sensing low blood flow through it, it's gonna release some factors to try to restore perfusion. This is an evolved trait um, that the same kind of process where we secrete different hormones to hold on to sodium, hold on to uh, water volume, secreting other different factors like inch two, right? To, and you'll end up getting, you know, holding on to more fluid, vasopressin, all those different things. Um, are the same processes that happen if we're hemorrhaging blood, for example. So if we are chased by a saber-toothed tiger and that saber-toothed tiger rips off our arm and we're, we lost an entire limb of volume, right, that we're going to have low perfusion to the kidney. The kidney is going to secrete those things to keep us alive, to hold on to what little volume we have left. The problem is with heart failure, that same system is evoked in, in heart failure, because it's sensing poor perfusion to kind of keep, hey, like I'm noticing there's low blood volume, there's low perfusion pressure, we need to hold on to volume. The problem is that, could, you know, while that's a, supposed to be a temporary fix from an emergent situation to preserve the body and life, um, this actually ends up leading to, to further complications. Um, we'll get into that later on, um, because it ends up making the heart have to work even a little bit harder. So um, again, we see these changes in, in blood flow uh, to, the, to the, the kidney and it ends up setting the stage for all these other compensations because of it, the body, notably the kidney, notices low perfusion through it, right? So again, um, you can think about it again. If we have low cardiac output, right, we're going to do things at the kidney, the renal, to hold on to sodium, hold on to water, right, to restore organ perfusion. But that actually increases vascular resistance, right? Now, that's a good thing in the immediate period. Again, that saber-toothed tiger example where a shark bites us in the water. But in heart failure, when that impaired perfusion to the kidneys due to actually the failed heart actually makes the cardiac output a little bit worse. And we'll show you another example of this. So again, we can get in this almost vicious cycle of compensation. Um, but again, as you see here, you know, these, these different neurohormonal factors are, are way out of balance, right? So here's an example of different uh, plasma levels of certain hormones, right? So norepinephrine, uh, renin, uh, AMP, endothelin-1. So endothelin-1, vasoconstrictor, plasmin renin, again, leading to the, the RAS system and AH2. And then norepinephrine, obviously, vasoconstrictor. These are out of balance, right? Much higher than we would see in a normal individual compared to someone with heart failure. We also see atrial natriuretic peptides increase, which, again, going back to normal physiology, the natriuretic peptides kind of counterbalance, right? They're, they're a negative feedback loop. Problem is, like, these are so much higher in terms of what's being activated because there's still a consistent low perfusion in the heart. It, 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 never, it never counter. Uh, never come, never, never counteracts or comes back into balance of compensation. So we lead to this vicious cycle of ventricular dysfunction leading to impaired cardiac output. We have compensations, right, to preserve the body because again, we have these evolved traits, right, to like, hey, we lost a limb. We need to do things to like keep keep organ perfusion. And we end up having, you know, vasoconstriction, water retention to hold on the volume. But that actually increases afterload, right, because we have raised, right, vasoconstriction, raised vascular resistance. And then we have excessive preload because we're holding on to more water, and we already have a failed heart. So we're flooding a failed heart with more volume and making the resistance it has to pump against higher, which leads to some worsening cardiac output and more and more compensations. So you can get in this vicious cycle um, and that's why you know, patients with heart failure are often in this tenuous balance 
um, between, you know, uh, w- uh, within their condition. Because again, we have these evolved, um, or we've evolved to have these compensations, but these are designed to be short-term emergent situations, right? Like we lost a limb, um, but we can't like, re- our, our body systems don't recognize, well, it's actually due to heart failure, not due to a saber-toothed tiger ripping off my limbs. Um, and again, you know, this is not something that is often, you know, you know, just a short-term thing, this ventricular dysfunction. So a lot of what we try to do, though, with heart failure is to bring these in balance, right? Because these things are important, we, you know, uh, we're, and we're finding that, you know, we do want some of these compensations. The problem is it's excessive, right? It's an excessive vasoconstriction to restore perfusion. It's an excessive retainment of, of volume. Um, so vasopressin, antidiuretic hormone, norepinephrine, all these different things, like there, there's too much of them, right? And not enough nitric oxide, ANP, which does increase, right? Because we have stretch of the atria because of heart failure. We also have you know, elevation in BNP. Um, that's also not enough to balance these out. So we end up having an, you know, a neurohormonal imbalance what we try to get patients to do or get them in a state of compensation where these factors are balanced out and we, we've kind of suppressed the amount of this and upped the amount of really of nitric oxide and other things because um, these are really respond to stretch. We don't want these to actually be super high. So again, the goal is to balance this out by decreasing the amount of these compensatory factors these will, should decrease alongside with it because these respond to overstretching of the ventricles. And we want to up the amount of nitric oxide as well as other, other things that we can do to bring these things back into balance. And that's what a lot of our medications uh, do um, to bring these different things back into balance, um, these different neurohormonal factors. Then another thing to kind of remember, again, you know, the name of the game with, 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 with heart failure are... Is, is myocardial performance, right? And it's a review of things that inf, you know, impact cardiac output. And remembering that a normal cardiac output for most people should be between 55, right, to 75%. Oop. And that remembering that cardiac output, um, and that's really, we're looking at ejection fraction, sorry, ejection fraction. Cardiac output, a little bit different. Ejection fraction um, is a way we often look at myocardial performance. <clears throat> And that's, uh, again, stroke volume over end diastolic volume, or EDV, right? So there are several different things that affect um, cardiac output, ejection fraction, different stuff like that. Um, and again, ejection fraction, of course, the product of heart rate times stroke volume equals Q. There are multiple things that can, can influence it, right? So preload, right? So if the heart's stretched, like we get during exercise, we end up having a higher stroke volume at the subsequent beat, right? So when that, you know, often when end diastolic volume increases in a normal heart, stroke volume tends to increase. Because we put a little stretch on the heart, um, almost kind of like similar to that we see with uh, plyometrics, that amortization phase almost, and we put a little stretch in the heart, it rebounds a little bit stronger contraction. Not the same exact property, but similar analogy. And then uh, afterload. Um, so again, afterload also influences cardiac output. Typically, if afterload is a little bit higher, that's going to impair cardiac output, primarily by imp- impairing um, stroke volume because it's you know, maybe a little bit harder to pump out. And then contractile state of the heart, right? Like its ability to, you know, contract and produce force, as well as obviously the heart rate. The heart rate's super high, or the heart rate increases, cardiac output tends to increase. If it's too high though, um, you know, and too high, or, or too high to allow normal filling, that will also affect cardiac output. So it's a you know, U-shaped curve here too. Now, um, that principle of stretch in the myocardium causing a higher stroke volume um, you know, it's, it's characterized by that, that Frank Starling mechanism we talked about in normal physiology right now. We, 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 we illustrated it there. Now, this is still present in patients with ventricular dysfunction and heart failure, but it follows a slightly different curve. It shifts to the right. So they still get, you know, a slight increase 
or still get an increase in stroke volume as stre the stretch of the ventricles increases, but it's a little bit attenuated. And this is kind of related to the uh, severity of, the, of heart failure, right? So we see you know, a shifting of that, of that, of that intrinsic property um, or the curve of that intrinsic property of the heart. So they lose some of that performance, right? So again, we talked about in these stretched hearts, um, they lose this contractile properties and, um, you know, as well as functional properties that occur like during exercise. They're not able to keep up, um, uh, you know, as, as, as well as a normal heart. Now, the other thing that we observe as, as well is that patients with a normal heart or normal left ventricular function, when uh, systemic vascular resistance increases, they're able, we're able to tolerate a little bit of an increase, right? Like, and it's one of the reasons why hypertension doesn't cause symptoms until it's really severe. Um, one, we have other, you know, the autoregulatory capacity and all that, but our heart's able to accommodate for increases in afterload, right, to a point, and it begins to drop off in terms of left ventricular function, looking at stroke volume here as, as our y-axis. However, in a patient with heart failure, they're very afterload sensitive. Even a slight increase in vascular resistance, we see pretty profound and rapid deterioration of myocardial performance, of left ventricular um, stroke volume. And, it, and this gets even more severe um, of a drop off in more severe cases. This is why vasodilator therapy is really, really important for patients with heart failure, which is counterintuitive because we want to restore perfusion pressure, but they are so afterload sensitive. They get a slight increase in afterload, they can have serious problems, which can further you know, deteriorate that vicious cycle of low perfusion, low, and then all those other compensations. So again, they're in this tenuous balance um, because of some of these structural changes within the heart, which lead to other changes elsewhere in the body, which can also feed into other changes in the heart. So again, um, we talked about structural issues. Their, their contractility is also impaired as well. So again, we see higher contractility, higher ability to, to generate force as well uh, during exercise in, in a normal, healthy individual. This is also impaired in patients. So those factors that in, that in, that, that uh, allow our heart to accommodate to demands of exercise are, are blunted or abnormal or diminished in patients with heart failure. So there's some very significant changes at the central level um, you know, in the heart, right? They, we lose the, the potentiation of the Frank Starling principle. Our hearts become afterload sensitive. We actually see you know, higher sympathetic nervous system activity at rest, but we, we see actually um, a lack of responsiveness to sympathetic stimulation during exercise because they're already at a bit of a higher level at rest. Their responsiveness isn't as, as profound. So you and I, those beta-1 receptors kick in. We can produce more force. That doesn't really happen as effectively in patients with heart failure. So there's a lot of structural and functional changes in their hearts that really impair their ability to maintain myocardial pumping performance during exercise. Now, um, as we've discussed throughout the entire course, it's not just what happens in this cog that impairs our ability to exercise. Obviously, there are profound changes that happen in the, the heart, right? And that which leads to these neurohormonal changes, right? Which also, you know, end up affecting the heart even more. But there are changes in the ventilatory system too. We talked about if, there, if there's impaired pumping performance, especially in the left ventricle, right? That's gonna backflow and fill the, the, the lungs of fluid altering gas exchange, right? Because we're raising filtration, pre or filtration pressures in the pulmonary vasculature, causing leakage of fluid into the alveolar or capillary interface impairing gas exchange. And then because we have poor perfusion to the muscle, we end up seeing changes to the muscle as well. And there are also changes in the sympathetic nervous system um, as well, and the metaboreceptors, the chemoreceptors um, that are embedded within the muscle. So some of our responses to exercise mediated through the muscles are changed. Um, so we see, again, 
Yeah, there are multiple different determinants of, of exercise, right? It's, it, the heart's a big part of it, right? Cardiac output times uh, AV2 difference is the equation for VO2. But what happens in the periphery also matters too, right? If we have endothelial dysfunction, right? If we have skeletal muscle um, hypoperfusion, which happens in heart failure, this happens in heart failure because usually patients with heart failure have had some cardio cardiovascular disease on top of it. So we see the skeletal abnorm um, abnormalities and dentatory inefficiency. So what we end up finding is obviously we know all these changes happen in the heart, but we're finding that what may end up being a bigger factor into determining the ability for a patient to exercise, to move with heart failure, maybe these peripheral changes that we call the muscle hypothesis or the skeletal muscle hypothesis, where that obviously patients with heart failure have left ventricular dysfunction, which leads to these you know, reductions in peripheral blood flow changes and sympathetic activation, that neurohormonal imbalance but then we also see this muscle wasting, right? Because of this low perfusion state, we see endothelial dysfunction as well in the peripheral uh, muscle beds. Um, and then because of some of these changes, these patients are very inactive, uh, profoundly inactive actually, um, which leads to disuse atrophy and other changes. And we're finding that, you know, what may better predict the ability for someone to exercise and heart failure may be more due to these peripheral changes. And we'll show you some examples of that in a bit, that you know, left ventricular performance and myocardial performance and cardiac output and ejection fraction may matter. But what happens in the periphery may be more meaningful um, to these patients. And here's just an, another image of kind of some of the changes that we see. Um, we see changes in blood flow to the, to the locomotor muscles. We see changes in myo mitochondrial function, changes in capillary density. We see increases in reactive oxygen species, ubiquitin pathways are changed. So we have profound atrophy and muscle wasting, right? You know, and, and on top of that, these patients are also profoundly inactive. So we have, you know, physiological ramifications from this condition, from this low perfusion, this catabolic, this inflammatory state of heart failure, and it's often compounded by inactivity. Um, we also see changes in uh, the lungs, right? We see this impaired, um, we see higher vascular resistance, which makes right ventricle work harder. We see um, impaired gas exchange, as well as we see this thing um, called the respiratory muscle metaboreflex, where the, the diaphragm is overworked in these patients due to some of the changes that occur with this disease, and it ends up stealing blood flow during exercise. So again, we talked about this, right? That there are these metaboreceptors that are located kind of everywhere in the body, right? Like they're, they're everywhere. Um, and they sense fatigue due to, uh, which are, you know, which come about when we, you know, when we produce these byproducts of um, anaerobic metabolism, for example, right? So um, it, there, there are fatigue sensors that get activated from the production of metabolites. Under normal conditions, right, we never get fatiguing contractions, right, which produces byproducts of the diaphragm. It rarely ever happens. However, in patients with heart failure, and there's other conditions too, um, because of the higher activity at work, because some of the changes in sympathetic nervous system activity, as well as changes in, in you know, pulmonary vasculature or, or respiratory efficiency, um, as well as, you know, you know, other issues, we get these fatiguing contractions of the diaphragm, which activate those type 3 and type 4 um, afferents, right, these metaboreceptors, these sympathetic afferents which sends signals to the brain say, hey, like the diaphragm is fatiguing. We need more blood flow, right, to, you know, to, to fuel the, the diaphragm, to fuel these breathing muscles, which ends up causing uh, sympathetic efferent discharge and causing limb vasoconstriction and decreased oxygen transport um, in the peripheral muscles, which leads to leg fatigue and effort perceptions. So basically what ends up happening is because the diaphragm and the breathing muscles perceive that they're overworked, they get, you know, they send signals through these type 3 and type 
for afferents, these metaboreceptors, to steal blood from the locomotor muscles um, to the diaphragm. And there's actually been experimental studies that have investigated this, that we actually see um, you know, blood flow changes in the, in the legs, which we think may also contribute right, to the, um, this, this impaired exercise capacity. So while the, the ventricles right, set the stage for this in heart failure, um, there are obviously changes we talked about in the muscle. There's even changes in the respiratory muscles that occur as well. So it's not just what happens in the heart. There's also all these other peripheral changes in the locomotor muscles, in the metaboreceptors, in the respiratory muscles, and the respiratory mu muscle metaboreceptors that impair right, the ability for these patients to exercise. And notably, if we look at, there's been studies that look at this, that look, look at ejection fraction in patients with heart failure and see does, does it correlate with functional capacity. And we're finding that it's not super strongly related. And I, and I can speak to this. I've worked with patients in, 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 with heart failure, in, in transplant rehab, cardiac rehab, that I had patients sometimes that would have an ejection fraction of 27% and compared to someone with an ejection fraction of you know, 35%, and the patient with 27% was able to walk laps around that person with a higher ejection fraction. And that may be due to some of the peripheral adaptations that they've made from exercise, right? They were more habitual exercises, exerciser, their muscles were more efficient with using what little blood flow they got, right? So it's not, ejection fraction just tells one story of it, right? Um, what happens in the periphery, what happens in the muscles matters too, right? So again, ejection fraction does not strongly correlate with functional capacity. Um, across the spectrum in patients with heart failure. There's other factors at play. And again, you know, this relationship between exercise limitations and heart failure that aren't only to eject, due to ejection fraction, what happens here, right? I think it all ties nicely to this model we've been trying to present throughout the entire semester that of this whipping wax and gas change gears, right? That we can have changes in, in all these cogs due to one condition. And, and, and quite often, you know, some of these peripheral changes, especially in the muscle, may end up predicting the ability for someone to exercise more than even what happens centrally, right? So again, obviously the, the, the changes in myocardial performance are significant and important, but we need to bear in mind that you know, just looking at ejection fraction doesn't tell you the whole story. And there are still things that we can do for patients by improving the efficiency of this cog to offset all the central changes. because. The problem with heart failure, like once there's changes with, in the structural changes in the heart, it's probably not super reversible. So, you know, your, your best bet to make inroads are really going to be here from a, from a rehab standpoint. So um, that ends kind of some of the pathophysiology that we touched on in heart failure. Um, again, the neurohormonal changes, the changes to the metabolic the muscle hypothesis of heart failure. And next we'll get into classifications and then we'll, we'll end with a little bit of the rehabilitation aspect of, of heart failure.